In this lecture, we're going to talk about one of two techniques that we're going to work with to help us measure the rate of photosynthesis. So the first technique that we're going to talk about is the floating disk method. And by now, you should have watched the Bozeman video. And he demonstrates how you set up the spinach disks and pull the air out of them so that they're going to sink. At the end of this video, he recorded a light on the disks that are in a beaker. And you can see that over time, the disks started to float. And the reason, again, that they are starting to float is because they're doing photosynthesis because we're providing energy, light energy, and that is allowing those cells to do photosynthesis and create oxygen. So when oxygen is produced in the leaves, then it makes them more buoyant and eventually they're going to rise. This is a very simple technique that we can use to measure the rate of photosynthesis, but sometimes it seems a little bit confusing if you do not understand what these graphs are attempting to show us here, and if you do not understand what we mean by this ET50. So I'm going to explain that and I'm going to show you how we're going to use the ET50 value to help us calculate a rate for photosynthesis in these different beakers like this one that we're going to set up and use in our lab. Let's first take a look at this example graph that I have here. And one thing I want to point out that I don't like about this graph is that we see these little marks right here, these increments, but we have the numbers in the middle of those. And I think that's really hard for people to read. So I'm encouraging you that whenever you set up your graphs, please make sure that you make these little tick marks, but go ahead and put a number on them and not put the number in the middle of those tick marks. So let me take a second to erase this. So once all of our beakers are set up with the 10 disks, we're going to set a timer and we're going to count the number of disks that are floating each minute. Now this graph is showing you the percent of the disks that are floating, but we're going to actually record the number that's floating. But you should still be able to understand what's going on, even if it's showing you percent over here. So at minute one, the students recorded that 0% of their disks are floating. Same at two and at three, and it looked like finally at minute four, some of the disks have risen to the top of the beaker. So they've recorded what percent has risen. You can tell that no more have risen between minute four and minute five, so that number stays the same, and so on. Let's talk about this ET50 value that they're showing you here. What we're going to do is note the time when half of the disks are floating in the beaker. And whatever that time is, that's considered your ET50 value. So if I ask you to identify the ET50 value for the disk in this beaker, then it looks like at this time right here, 50% of the disks were floating. If I asked you to record the ET50 value, then it would be at... 6.5 minutes because it looks like it was at about six and a half minutes whenever half of the disks were floating in the beaker. In a second, I'm going to tell you why we are going to use this ET50 value and not just how long it takes for all the disks to float. But let's just go through another example here to make sure that you can read these graphs and understand what the ET50 value is. So what I have set up here is here's the disk and it's telling you here what we did to them or what treatment we have established. And here is the, the data of our results. So it says the beaker was placed under a light with an intensity of 90 FTC. Now, honestly, I don't know what FTC means. I attempted to look it up, and it was taking too long. So it's some kind of indication of light intensity. So we can use watts, or sometimes we see light intensity reported as lumens. And this is just another way that we're showing you a unit for light intensity. So basically, this is saying that we set it up underneath a light, and it's at this intensity. We're going to record the number of disks that are floating at each minute, and that's what this graph is attempting to show you. So at minute zero, there was zero. At one, two, three, four, five, we didn't get any disk floating until about minute six. And you can tell up here that we put 10 disks total into the beaker. I know that doesn't exactly match the photo, but bear with me here. According to the data, what is our ET50? So take a second to read that graph and see if you can figure out what that value is. First, we have to note that half of 10 is 5. So here is 5 disks. And it looks like 
some time after about 11 minutes, maybe close to 12 minutes, indicate 12 there, half of the tin discs were floating. So our ET50 value is 12, 12 minutes. And I'm going to indicate that up here. Remember, though, we're trying to calculate the rate of photosynthesis. And right now, I just have a time. And we know that rate is something, the change in something, over the change in time. But we really don't have a change in something. So in this situation, we're going to use just an arbitrary number, the number 1, and we're going to divide that by our time. Because remember, rate is the change in something over the change in time. So we're going to have 1 divided by this time. So to calculate the rate of photosynthesis in this beaker, we're going to take 1 divided by 12 minutes, and that gives us 0 0.083. That number is giving us an indication of the rate or the speed of photosynthesis that's occurring in these cells in the speaker with the treatment. Now that was just a brief overview of how we read the graph and figure out ET50 and how we're going to take that ET50 value and we're going to calculate a rate. But I want to make sure you understand what this ET50 value is. It's been a while since we've talked about median, but the ET50 value is actually a median value. It's the middle value in our data set. And again, it's the time that it took 50% of the disk to float. I feel like students often want to use mean whenever they're calculating data because it seems to be the always go-to. Most of the time we're calculating an average. But the mean is not going to work in this case, and I want to talk about why. So I have an example data set down here, and it is showing you the times that a disk was floating. So the first disk floated at 5 minutes and the second disk floated at 10 and so on. So let's say that we calculated an average, how long it took for these disks to float. So I would add them all up and I think there's 10 there so I'm going to divide by 10 and that would give me a mean value of 101 minutes. So we're saying that it took 101 minutes for the disk to float on average. But if you notice we have some skewed data towards this end of our data set. Sometimes in this experiment, what can happen is the disks can get stuck. They can get stuck on the bottom of the beaker or they're stuck on the side of the beaker and students will tap the beaker and as soon as they tap it, then it seems like that releases them and they'll move to the top. But that whole time where they probably should be floating, they weren't floating because they were stuck to the side or to the bottom of the beaker. And that's what's going on most likely in this case right here. So when those discs are stuck, they're not going to float to the top. And so we can time them and get these very large values in time simply because they're stuck. And data points like that are going to skew our results. If we use the medium value, then that's going to give us more accurate measurements on really the middle amount of time that it takes for these disks to float. As a reminder, to calculate medium, we line up our data points and then we start crossing them off to figure out that middle value. And in this case, the middle value was 20 minutes. So in this situation, our ET50 is 20 minutes. Now to calculate rate, what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 divided by ET50. So we're going to take 1 divided by 20. And that gives us 0 0.05. And again, that's an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. Now let's compare the results here because I have information from two different treatments because the first speaker I put under a light with this intensity and the data that I have in the second box is data from a beaker that was placed under a light that was at that intensity. So we have a lower intensity of light with this second data set. So let's compare results there to figure out who has the higher rate of photosynthesis. You can probably already tell me without looking at the results that if there's a brighter light or there's 
greater light intensity, then there's going to be a higher rate of photosynthesis. And that is verified by these results because 0 0.083 is a higher rate than 0 0.05. Now let's take a look at these two graphs. And I'm attempting to show you why we just don't figure out ET50 like we see here and plot those data points. The two scenarios that I set up here, remember one was at 900, so I'm going to put a 900 here. And the other one was set up and I said it was at 100, so I'm going to add a 100 here. And if you remember, the ET50 for the beaker that was underneath the light at intensity of 900, it was about 12. And that's what this is showing you, about right here would be 12, that would be the ET50 for the first beaker. And then the beaker that was put under the light with the intensity of only 100, we can see that its ET50 was about 20. And that's about what we have right here. So let's connect those dots. If you were just glancing at the results in this graph, what does it look like is happening to the rate of photosynthesis as light intensity is increasing? Well, here we have light intensity increasing as we move this way and it looks like the rate of photosynthesis is dropping. ET50 is dropping. Well, ET50 is dropping, but really the rate of photosynthesis is not dropping. But, but that is what anyone's going to think if they take a look at this graph. They're going to think that the rate of photosynthesis is dropping as light intensity increases. If we calculate 1 over ET50, and you can see that right here, and we're indicating that so we have a unit there and an idea of what it is that we're calculating. When we do that and we graph these data points, then we're going to see here was our rate, our 1 over ET50, and it was about 0 0.05. And then our other rate that we calculated was more about right here. And if at 0 we calculate the rate was at 0, but remember we don't always connect back to 0 unless we test at 0. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw a line here to connect those dots. So now when we look at this graph, then we're going to make a judgment that as light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And it shows a better relationship about what happens to rate as we're changing light intensity. So when you're showing your results on a graph, we're not going to graph just the change in a treatment in relation to ET50. So let's put a big line through that, because when we do that, then it would appear that as you're increasing your treatment, then the rate of photosynthesis decreases. And we know that's not the case in this situation. But we are going to calculate 1 over ET50 and graph those data points. And that's going to show us the correct relationship. So this is showing you as light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases as well. I want to go through an example lab design because you guys are ultimately going to pick your treatments or pick your IVs that you want to test. And you're going to set up this experiment. You're going to determine ET50, you're going to calculate rate by taking 1 divided by ET50, and then you're going to show that on a graph that shows how changing your IV is affecting your rate of photosynthesis. So here's an example lab design. You guys are going to set up several beakers. You're going to pick which independent variable that you want to test. So let's say that you want to see how CO2 concentration affects rate of photosynthesis. And this is pretty easy to do because we're going to use baking soda as our CO2 source. And I believe the video with Mr. Anderson indicated that in about 100 mils we were putting one gram of baking soda. So it'd be very easy to change the concentration or the amount of baking soda that we're using and that would result in increasing the CO2 concentrations or decreasing the CO concentrations. So let's say that I decide to put in zero grams of baking soda and again, this is our CO2 source in 100 milliliters of water. And then I decided to do 0.25 grams and 0.5 grams and let's say 1 gram. So I'm varying the concentration of CO2 in the water. So again, we're going to figure out ET50. And that is the time that half the disk are floating. And then once we have that value, then we're going to calculate the rate. And that's 1 over ET50. So we're going to do that for every single one of these treatments. And what you're doing is you're calculating just one data point for the graph. So if this graph is showing you 
an increase in CO2 concentrations over time. When you get this 1 over ET50 value, it's just going to be one data point. So when you make that rate calculation, you're going to get a number for rate, and you're going to plot that data point. And same with this. This one is going to be a data point on your graph, and so on. So in this situation, if you set up four beakers, then you're going to have four data points. And you can see a trend of how rate is changing as CO2 concentrations are changing as well. I've included a list here of some possible variables that your group can choose to test. CO2 concentrations, we can attempt to change temperature of the water. We can change light intensity um, by either changing the bulbs of the light or we can move them further away from a light source. And then I have some clear paper that's different colors that we can use to cover the beakers or, or cover the lights so that we can change the color of light that's reaching the disc in the beaker. And then we can also test different types of leaves from different types of plants. We're probably going to use spinach leaves, but we can also get some leaves that are maybe purple in color versus green in color. So there's lots of different variables that you can choose to test. So your group is going to have to decide on that. But one thing I want to point out is that showing you these graphs, you should already have an idea of what these rate curves are going to look like. If you remember, our equation for photosynthesis, CO2 plus light plus water yields O2 and glucose. We've talked about before that if you change the concentration of the reactants, then that's going to affect rate of these reactions. So as CO2 concentration goes up, so should rate, but eventually it should level off because those enzymes that fix CO2 can only fix CO2 at a certain rate. Eventually those enzymes are going to become saturated and adding more CO2 isn't going to increase the rate of reaction. If we increase light intensity, we should see an increase and then again a leveling off. If we increased the amount of water, we would see an increase, but then again, a leveling off of rate of photosynthesis. And then finally with temperature, remember that the temperature graph looks like this, but eventually all those enzymes that are fixing CO2 and attempting to help those chloroplasts make the ATP and the NADPH, the electron transport chain, those proteins can become denatured at high temperatures. And so then if they're not functioning, then the rate of photosynthesis will drop. So again, these are all graphs that you probably could have already drawn. And if you're going to set up an experiment and test one of these different variables, then you should have an idea of the results that we are expecting to get. I usually have plenty of students that want to test how the color of light would affect the rate of photosynthesis. So I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the visible light spectrum. Because most of you are probably going to utilize a white light bulb and then we're going to use that colored paper to change which color of light is actually reaching the leaf discs in the beaker. You probably have been exposed to the idea that white light contains all the colors of the visible spectrum. You probably heard of Roy G. Biv. Those are the colors of the rainbow. And if you take white light and you can break it apart into the different colors, you would see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And we'll do a quick demo in class where I'm going to give you these little devices and if you just hold them up to white light, then you're going to see the colors of the rainbow because they're going to take that white light and they're going to break it into the individual wavelengths of light associated with each of those different colors. Now each color of light has its own wavelength and that's what it's attempting to show you in this graph that I've shown you before. So again, we have Roy G. Biv. And you can see that red has a wavelength of light near 700 nanometers, whereas violet has a wavelength of light near 400 nanometers. And this is also showing you again that these accessory pigments like chlorophyll B and the carotenoids and the xanthophylls, they will absorb different wavelengths of light better than others. Now let's talk about this diagram that I have here, and that relates to this information that you see at the bottom of the page. You need to be able to read a chart like this and have an understanding of which wavelength of light contains the most energy. I feel that most students would guess that red has the most energy, but 
the reverse is actually true. Red has the lowest amount of energy compared to all the other colors. Violet has the greatest or the most amount of energy compared to the other colors. And that's indicated here in this diagram. But if this is something that you have to have memorized, I think it's really easy for students to memorize that violet has more energy compared to the red. If you look right here, it's showing you that they're taking this small little area here that is the visible light spectrum, and they're trying to blow it up here so that you can see better the different wavelengths of light that fall within the visible light spectrum. And you can see right next to the visible light spectrum is UV. And you know that UV stands for ultraviolet, and you know that if you get too many ultraviolet rays from the sun, that it's going to burn your skin. So that must mean that ultraviolet light has a lot of energy to it. So here's violet, and right next to violet is ultraviolet. Ultra means beyond. So these wavelengths of light here are past violet, they're ultraviolet, and we already said that they contain a lot of energy, enough that if you're exposed to too many UV rays, then you're going to have a sunburn. So just because we know what UV means, I think it's really easy for you to remember that if violet is right next to ultraviolet, then it's going to have more energy compared to all these other colors on the visible light spectrum. Now if you're asked to understand what we mean by wavelengths here, let me show you why violet has more energy compared to the red. So imagine you are standing on a shore, a shoreline, and there's waves lapping at your feet. And let's say you have a wave coming at you like this. Now from here to here represents one wavelength. And I believe that's a symbol for a wavelength. If you want to write that out, go for it. But that's one wavelength. Now imagine what's going to happen when this wave hits you. You have a lot of energy in that wave because it has a very short wavelength, which is what that is indicating right down there. Let's take a look at you compared to red. So again, we're just going to envision that there's a wave coming at you and you're standing on a shoreline and the wave looks like this. So from here to here is one wavelength. So there is a longer wavelength when we have red light. And the last bit of information that I want to talk about is the fact that plants come in different colors and the reason why plants look different colors is because of the pigments and what lights are being absorbed and what lights are being reflected. So if a plant looks green, then that means that all these other colors are being absorbed by pigments in the plant. But there's no pigments that can absorb green light, and so that green light is being reflected off the plant. And as a matter of fact, that is the wavelength of light that is being reflected off, and our eyes are picking that up, and that's why our eyes see green when we look at that type of plant. So let's just indicate reflected. And that's what makes us think that's a green plant.